Thank you. Okay, well, thanks for um, devoting part of a Friday night in Vienna. I'll try to make it worth your while. So, um, as mentioned, I've now uh, I've been I've been based in Sydney virtually all my life. I've travelled a ridiculous number of times to Europe, but I've never actually lived here. Well, I'm about to move to Kingston in London, where I'll be heading up the School of Economics, History and Politics, and with the explicit uh, goal of making it into a heterodox university that actually blends history and politics as well in its teaching. So we've got a non-orthodox approach to economics and a, a strongly pluralist education. Um, and you find you're not getting where you are, come to Kingston, please. Okay. Well, I'm going to start with two critical perspectives on both the Euro and economics. And this is a remarkable article from 1992 by the post-Keynesian economist Lynn Godley, writing in, I think, the London Review of Books, and the title of Maastricht and all that, written at the time that this Maastricht Treaty had just been signed. And looking at it, he said, well, the treaty proposes no institutions other than a bank, and the sponsors must therefore believe that's all you need. But he said that could only be true if modern economies were self-regulating, self-adjusting. And basically said, since that's false, uh, then if a country goes into a downturn and it has no power to devalue, and it doesn't get fiscal equalisation either because there was no treasury plan, then the only there's nothing to stop it suffering a process of cumulative internal decline, bleeding in the end to emigration as the only alternative to poverty or starvation. Now, written back in 1992, that would have been seen as outrageously excessive. Ask anybody in Greece whether that's outrageously excessive today, or Spain, and even parts of Italy. So that's uh, from the, the critic of individual economic theory. This is somebody who, of course, got a Nobel Prize in economic theory. And reflecting on what he thought was a state of modern macroeconomics in 2006, this is what Robert Sowell had to say is that the only way he could explain it is that maybe there is in human nature some deep-seated perverse pleasure in adopting and defending a wholly counterintuitive doctrine that leaves the uninitiated peasant wondering what planet he or she is on. That's from right in the heart of neoclassical economics. Okay. So to be criticising the theory doesn't just mean you stand outside it. Sometimes it means you stand inside and you've got every right to be criticising the theory. So I'll start with two paradoxical propositions about economics as well. Most of the policy advice concerns what to do about money, running deficits and things like that, bank loans and so on. And mainstream macroeconomists economists know almost nothing about money. In fact, the major part of economic theory is explaining why you don't need to have money in your macroeconomic models. And they ignore the role of private debt, which I'm going to argue is crucial. And they fixate on reducing public debt even during what happens to be a private debt crisis, and I'm sure that applies to Greece as well as to uh, the rest of, uh, rest of Europe and America. So does private debt matter? Well, according to conventional economic theory, if you ask a new classical economy, neoclassical, the answer will be never. And if you ask a saltwater, as they call themselves, neoclassical, somebody like Paul Krugman, the new Keynesians, or Ben Bernanke, they'll say, well, it does during the liquidity trap, but otherwise you can ignore it. And why is that? Well, they start from the a priori logic, the correct proposition, saying that somebody's liability is somebody else's asset. Okay? There's always those two sides to any, any debt. So this is Paul Krugman talking about Richard Koo, whose approach to economics is very similar to mine. And talking about Koo, he says, well, Koo appears to envision an economy where everyone is balance sheet, balance sheet constrained. And he said, as opposed to one in which lots of people are. And he said, well, he thinks Ku's vision makes no sense. He says, where there are debtors, there must also be creditors. So there have to be some people who can respond to lower interest rates during a, uh, even during a balance, street, balance sheet recession. So he's saying Ku's got to be wrong. Some logical flaw in Ku's argument. So the mainstream view is that if somebody in this particular situation, if you have a, a, um, a balance sheet recession applying and people repay debts, then the person who repays the debt can spend less, but the person who, can, who is repaid can spend more. And overall they cancel each other out, unless you're in the situation where the equilibrium rate of interest is below zero, in which case you can't encourage people who are by nature savers to spend enough money to make up for those who are by nature spenders uh, being unable to spend. So it's only in a liquidity trap that you have a problem. Well, I'm going to check the logic of this more carefully, and I had to find a macroeconomic model of the neoclassical theory that actually had a bank in it. 
which is an incredibly hard thing to do because most of them not only do they ignore money and debt, they also ignore banks. And in the in the substance of this particular paper, published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, there was no money and there were no banks. There was debt, but no money and no banks. In the appendix, they had a bank, which is a remarkable thing. Because normally, if you ask a conventional economist, like, for example, Paul Krugman, he'll tell you that banks don't matter. And he told me that. Uh, if you might remember the, the blog war that I had with him uh, back in 2012, and he said that I said putting banks in the story is essential. Uh, I just love this line coming from the point of view that I have. It says, now I'm all for including the banking sector in stories, but it's relevant. But why is it so crucial to a story about debt and leverage? Now, only a conventionally trained economist could say something like that. And he says, well, I say it's because once you include banks, lending increases the money supply. And he then says, okay, but why does that matter? Uh, and argues that I seem to assume, which I did not, but that was his way of interpreting me, I seem to assume that aggregate demand can't increase unless the money supply rises. She said, but that's only true if the money velocity is fixed. So we suddenly all become monetarists while I wasn't looking. Well, no, but anyway. And he said, in the model that he uses with uh, Eckertson, lending can increase aggregate demand. So what's the problem? You know, so what I'm talking about is insignificant, in other words. Well, what he has in that paper is a model in which there are patient agents who save money, which is then linked to impatient agents. And in the body of the, the paper, it's direct lending, but in an appendix, they have a bank, which acts as an intermediary. So it facilitates the loan, and it charges the lender, who's the patient agent, an intermediation fee. That's how it makes its money. Now, I'm going to replicate that in a software package I call Minsky, which I'm, I'm wearing a T-shirt for here right now. Stability is destabilizing. And it's an open source, System Dynamics programs. Anybody know what I mean when I say System Dynamics? Hands up if you do. Yeah, that's, everybody in economics should know that. Okay? But we don't because the focus is still static equilibrium thinking in economics, unfortunately. Now, so I model it using a System Dynamics program. I do not reproduce a lot of the standard elements of a new Keynesian model. For example, I don't have a representative agent who's a hybrid of workers and capitalists. So in my model, the distribution of income does matter. And I don't endow the my agents with prophetic expectations. Now, I know neoclassicals call this rational, but the way they define rational is the way the dictionary defines prophetic. So I'm going to continue calling it prophetic expectations from now on. Okay. Um, so what I have in my model is that both patient agents and inpatient agents are capitalists. The patient agent produces the consumption good, which is what they have in the Nickerson and Krugman model. The impatient agent borrows, and spend, borrows, uh, borrows money from the patient agent and produces the investment good. Notice, by the way, economists, neoclassicals can't help but use terms pejoratively. Who's the good person out of a patient and an impatient person? Okay. Which one's got more moral fibre? Patient one, isn't it? Yeah. It's loaded, loaded terminology. It's can't help themselves. Um, so that in my model, they, they both hire workers, they produce output, they sell to each other, to workers and, banker, and the banker, and I just see what the dynamics is like. So Minsky is designed so you can use a balance sheet like accountants do. Who's doing accounting here? Any accounting students? No accounting students? Okay. I've become an accounting student the hard way by realising its significance in explaining how money works, but anyway. Uh, what, what you do with a balance sheet is that everything has to sum to zero across the rows. Okay? For every entry on a line of a ledger, there has to be an opposite point of an opposite sign. So I use this convention in this software package called Minsky, and all the flows of money. Can you see the red and you can see the red and black there anyway, if not the words. Okay, so the first row here has leaning from the consumer agent to the investment agent. And it goes from here to here, which is from the, from, the, from the deposit account of the consumption agent to the deposit account of the investment agent. That's the lending act. And I'm using the convention that electrical engineers use as well, which show all flows from plus to minus. Okay? So that's, that's the straight accounting convention. I can use debit and credit like accountants do as well. I find that more confusing than the electrical engineer's approach. And the Minsky software shows liabilities as negative and also equity as negative and assets as positive. So you notice the initial amounts in the deposit accounts are shown as minus 80 for the consumers, minus 20 for the investment and so on. 
That's because, from the point of view of a bank, the deposits are a liability of the bank. So I'm showing you from the bank's perspective. At a later stage, I'll show the turn up positive when you see it from the point of view of each of those agents independently. Assets are positive. So across any row, everything sums to zero, including the initial conditions. And the program makes sure, or lets you know whether you've made a mistake by doing the row sum for you. Okay? But that's the check to make sure you've got the accounting correct. So once you've got that right, your financial flows are accurately described. So having done that, what I've actually done with that table, you notice I have words like lend and I, lend for lending, repay for repayment, INT for interest, etc., etc. It generates a system of differential equations. So if you use the program yourself, that's what you do when you build and set up a table like that. Pretty complicated, eh? The idea is to make the complicated stuff more straightforward. And now I'll notice I've got an uh, so example for the deposits of the consumption agent up here. I've got interest uh, coming in, repayment coming in, purchasing by the investment agent, consumption by workers, consumption by bankers, all inflows, and outflows being lending money, paying the intermediation fee, wages for the workers in your sector and your own consumption. Okay? Well, they're defined using a flowchart. This is the idea of systems dynamics. Rather than writing equations down, you write a flowchart. So that flowchart saying RL multiplied by loans is equal to, uh, linked to interest is actually saying interest is equal to the rate of interest on loans multiplied by the level of loans. So you define all your equation that way, put your parameter values in and so on, and you can then simulate it. Now, the remaining uh, elements, obviously, if you're working out interest payments on loans, it's, it's an obvious equation, rate of interest times the amount of loans. When I'm talking about things like flows, like the level of lending, I use a system engineering concept called time constant. And these are variable time constants. You can change them while the program runs. But the idea there is, you, uh, you, you might say that the rate of, rate of lending is some exponential function of the amount of money left in the deposit account. And that's what that equation actually says. But by putting it as a division here, that way, you end up using a, a number which makes sense in the dimension of the activity you're looking at. So lending money, uh, it's related to how many years, if you continue lending at that rate, how long before your account will fall to zero. Okay. If, you, if you lend it, the rate I've got in this equation, the initial rate I use, and you continue that rate of lending, and you've got no new inflows coming back into the account, then I've, since I use the time, the time constant of seven, that says after seven years you have no money in your account. That's what's going on there. So it tells you how long you take a driver's drop to zero or rise exponentially to, to a double level. And if I bring this up here and just show the little movie here, as I vary, notice there's a slider here, and I'm moving the value up and down. As I change the slider, I make the number larger, it takes longer to lend the money out, so less lending occurs. I make it smaller, more, a little more lending occurs. That's the sort of idea in the software. So the full model looks like this. Okay, and those ionic column buildings there, they all have bank accounts behind them like the one I showed you earlier. So that, that is the... Uh, Accounts seen from the bank's point of view, that's from the consumer agent's point of view, that's from the uh, investment agent's point of view, and that's from the workers. So let's run it, see what happens. And when you run it, you find the neoclassicals are right, because as I run the model, I'm going to change these two things over here, which are the rate of uh, lending and the rate of repayment. And notice the red line, which is the amount of debt, goes up and down like crazy. And GDP does change, goes up and down a bit as velocity changes because some agents have faster and slower rates of spending than other agents. Uh, but I can have a huge boom in the level of debt, so I can have debt becoming about twice GDP or much, much lower than GDP. And after I've done that for 600 years, the level of GDP is still much the same as it was at the beginning. Okay? There's been no change in magnitude, up and down in levels, given changes in velocity, but not much action apart from that. And why is that? It's because there's no change in the amount of money in that model. When you have to then craft a question, which neoclassicals refuse to do, 
They don't actually have a sensible answer for what money is. Money in a capitalist economy is the liability plus the, plus the equity of the banking sector. So the liability of the banking sector to the rest of the economy plus their own equity is the money that's in circulation in the economy. In that model, it's the sum of what's in the consumer's account, what's in the investing agent's account, what's in the workers' and what's in the bankers' e equity account. Now, in loanable funds, when you add those all together, you get zero. The rate of change of all those, you shuffle where the money is, you don't change the absolute amount of money. So that's what's known in dynamic systems as a conservative system. Something is fixed, in this case, for something is the amount of money in the model. But debt in this model is a dissipative system. Now, dissipative means it can rise or fall. There's no fixed amount that has to be maintained over time. So the rate of change of debt is lending minus repayments. And that can be, become very big or very small, whatever, reach the earth, but can be positive or negative. There's no control on that. So therefore, the change in the amount of debt is unrelated to the change in money. And the only, you only have a minor impact upon GDP because changes in GDP are caused by changes in the velocity of circulation. So if you look at GDP using a very simplistic way of defining this, um, if you define, you define the velocity of money as, as the amount of GDP divided by the money stock. So just using an identity, I can then say that GDP is roughly speaking the velocity of money times the amount of money. And in this model, there's only high powered money, money created by somebody outside the system, the government in this case. So change in GDP is therefore you apply the product rule but in this model, there's no change. I haven't got the government changing the amount of money it's created in the system. So it all boils down to that changes in GDP are simply the amount of money in the economy multiplied by changes in velocity. And that's the only change you get. But it isn't the case that patient agents lend to impatient agents. Okay? In the real world, banks lend to non-banks. So I can modify that model and to make it more realistic be by saying the loan is not an asset of the consumer sector. I'm sure there are some cases where you, know, you might lend money to somebody to go and buy dinner, you know, or, or maybe a firm, a firm will issue bonds and get the money from elsewhere in society that way. But the major of lending in our system is the bank lends to a non-bank. So I'm going to, to show that, I'm going to delete the argument that the bank is an asset of the consumer agent and make it instead an asset of the bank. And that's quite easy to do in Minsk. I've recorded a little movie here of me doing it. It takes about 45 seconds. So I've got the, the table for the consumer agent here and the table for the bank here. I'm going to delete this column, first of all, and then insert it over here. And Minsky takes care of all the accounting that's involved when you make that change. So come across with the cursor and delete the column there for loans. So they disappear. And then I've got to get rid of the rows that relate to loans, interest payments, bank fee, debt repayment, they all go. Then come down to the banks column, table, insert a new column for, for assets, and the click down so it lets you know what, what, what assets haven't been allocated. Once I do that, it brings across the accounting for loans and repayment, Then I'm deleting the intermediation fee, which is silly, doesn't need to, you need to worry about that, and I'm adding in the interest payments go to the bank. So that took about 45 seconds. And once I've done that, I can now simulate the model again. And it's rather different. For a start, instantly GDP is rising as well as the amount of debt. Okay. And then if there's a slowdown in the rate of growth of debt, there's a slowdown in GDP as well. So changes in what happens to the level of debt dramatically affect the level of economic activity. Velocity still has an impact. Velocity still changes. But by far the most important variable is the amount of debt in the system. And after I run it for roughly the same length of time, rather than having no level of GDP measured in, in hundreds, I've got it measured in hundreds of millions because I've run it for 600 years and there's been a dramatic increase in the size of the economy. So this change, the change in debt changes the amount of money in the system. And the mathematics is still correct, all the accounting still works out correctly. But now when you take a look at it, the rate of change of money is equal to the rate of change of debt. Okay. Increase the debt level, you increase the money supply because when you get a loan from a bank, it says, here's you owe us a million dollars, and here's a million dollars. Creating a debt creates the deposit at the same time. 
So when you look at what effective demand in this system, it's not just velocity of money times the amount of money, it's that plus the change in debt coming in instantaneously each time it's done. So that's the circulation of existing money. And that's the instantaneous spending into the economy of newly created credit money. And therefore your change in demand is a much more complicated expression. And when you work it out, you've now got three terms to look at. One being velocity times the rate of change of debt, and the other being the acceleration of debt. Those two factors turn up and how much demand you have in the economy. Of course, those two factors are ignored by mainstream macro. Now, if you ignore them, it's no wonder you don't see a crisis coming, because they're what caused the crisis. So, well, I'll put these slides up on my website, by the way, for those who are trying to take the equations down there. Okay. Now, since the mainstream economics failed to see the crisis coming because they ignored private debt. And if you look at what they had to say, rather than warning for a potential crisis, they were telling politicians to go and take a holiday on the Black Sea or the Mediterranean and enjoy yourself, nothing to worry about. Saying they took the view that the US slowdown was not heralding a period of worldwide economic weakness. This is in June 2007, two months before the crisis is regarded as having started. So that there'd be a smooth rebalancing, and wait for this, with Europe taking over the baton of growth from the, Europe, from the United States. And they said the current situation is better than we've experienced in years. Just think how relaxed all the politicians would be feeling. No wonder they got such a huge shock when the, almost the exact reverse occurred. You know, they were told to expect sunshine and they got, uh, they got cyclone Katrina. They're saying our central forecast remains indeed quite benign. A strong and sustained recovery in Europe, falling unemployment and, and, and job creation. That's what they thought was going to happen, and that's widespread. There was no neoclassical model, period, that predicted this. There were some neoclassical economists who had worries. Joe Stiglitz was one, Krugman to some extent. Certainly Robert uh, Schiller is really the one of the people I have the most respect for. Uh, but generally speaking, the models, no problem at all, so far as they saw. Now, from my point of view, working from Minsky's financial instability hypothesis and focusing on the level of debt, that's the first thing I looked at when I was asked to do a, a, a law case concerning a Frederick Lender back in December 2005. And as soon as I saw it, I thought, holy hell, there's going to be a crisis. Somebody has to raise the alarm, and at least in my own country, I was that somebody. So here's the level of private debt. The blue line is government debt, the one that the politicians and economists normally obsess about. And notice that that's come down from 110% of GDP back in 1945 to of the order of 60% by 2005, when I realised there was going to be a problem. But private debt's gone from 35% of GDP to at the time I made the alarm, 150%. And I thought that trend can't be sustained. When it starts to slow down, there'll be a crisis. And what I expected was to see it start to fall after the crisis began. Well, here's the extending time onto today. There's the continued rise for a while and then the fall in the level of private debt. And notice the level of public debt starts to rise after the crisis. Okay. The increase in public debt, which has been the thing that conventional economists have fi fixated upon, began about six months, actually about a, more than, yeah, about, about six months after the, actually more than that. Look at it, about 2000, 2008. Uh, I've got the crisis mark there, but it had been about six months after the crisis itself. Well, my call was a crisis would start when the rate of growth of debt slowed down. It, it wasn't obvious. The debt was still rising there, as you would have realised. So here's looking at the change in debt. And there's the, the absolute level of debt on the left-hand side, but the black line was measured on the right-hand axis as the change in debt. There's when the crisis began in 2008. That's when you had change in debt going from plus 16% of GDP to at its bottom about minus 4% in 2010. Then you notice now it's rising again. Now let's look at the relationship I made I argue between change in debt and the level of unemployment. And bear in mind conventional economic theory says this should have no impact. Okay, if you did an R squared or a correlation, a correlation coefficient should be trivial, somewhere near zero. Insignificant. You want to guess the correlation coefficient there? Okay. So debt growth slowed down. That's when the crisis began. And the correlation is minus 
which I think would be significant from completely different from zero. But that's how strong the impact is. And then the second factor is the acceleration of debt and change in, change in unemployment. And I'll turn the unemployment, the change in unemployment upside down so the correlation is more obvious there. And the crisis began when you had this massive deceleration in debt from rising at a peak of about 12% of GDP per annum per annum down to minus 12.5% in the depth of the crisis. And the correlation coefficient there, minus 0.6. So you know, a powerful effect of the second order in economic data. I really didn't expect the data to be able to confirm this. I thought it was just too difficult to imagine that economic data would be fine enough to show a relationship between the second differential and the first differential, but I was wrong. A couple of um, English-based and Nordic-based, actually uh, Dutch-based economists, uh, Biggs, Meyer and Peck, were the first ones to publish on this. They call it the credit impulse uh, back in about 2008. So what then happened to government debt? It was a symptom of the change. It rose after the crisis began while private debt was still rising as well. It was the rate of slowdown in private debt that began the crisis. And that rise in net government spending softened the impact of the private sector deleveraging. Now, partly it was deliberate policy, I mean, things like the Cash for Clunkers campaign and various you know, economic stimuli that the Obama government put in place. But it was mainly simply automatic from a sharp fall in tax revenue, for obvious reasons, firms are going bankrupt, workers were losing their jobs, and an increase in welfare spending. And that was far larger than what happened back in the Great Depression because taxes and government spending are far larger now than they were back during the 1930s. So that increase in government debt began after the crisis. It wasn't the cause, it was a symptom, but it was also a symptomatic change that made it less severe. My analogy is always like an a, um, air conditioning system. Okay? If it gets, cold, if it gets hotter, hotter outside, the air conditioning, air conditioning system pumps in cold air. Now what's been happening with the um, euro, euro, it's got colder outside and they've pumped in cold air. The wrong thing. So to, to me and to a Framinsky point of view, that government spending was a, it wasn't the only way to solve the problem, but it was a necessary part of making this, the crisis less extreme. Whereas the mainstream was into this delusion they call expansionary fiscal consolidation, that links to a paper in the OECD report in June of 2007, before the crisis began advocating fiscal consolidation. Now, what's that? Well, this comes from a guy called Robert Barrow and an agent called Ricardian Equivalents. Anybody heard of that before? A few, okay. Have you read the original Robert Barrow paper? This is one reason I don't reach out of textbooks, because textbooks operate like sanitising devices on economic theory. You get a load of stuff that, I'll use the expression, smells bad, okay? And they make it smell good in the textbook. Read the originals, because when you read the originals, unless you've been so affected by this way of being trained that you actually don't see whether you're reading nonsense, it's obvious that it's nonsense. So writing back in 1989, a paper called The Ricardian Approach to Budget Deficits, these are the propositions he made. He said, a deficit cut now leads to high future taxes. Okay. So if you have less taxes now, you've got to have higher ones in the future. So a cut today must be matched by an increase in the future. All this I'm going to challenge later. He said, then suppose, and those, one of my students used to say, when economists say assume, what they actually mean is pretend. Okay? <laughs> Let's pretend that household demand for goods depend upon expected present value of taxes. Therefore, the budget deficit now must have no impact on aggregate demand for goods. You can't stimulate the economy. He said a current budget deficit leads to an offsetting increase in private savings, therefore no change in savings, no change in spending. So completely cancelled out. If, you didn't use the word if, I put it in there, we assume, and this is what he assumes, that there's a network of intergenerational transfers which makes the typical person part of an extended family that goes on forever. <laughs> okay? And in this setting, households plan effectively with an infinite horizon. <laughs> so when you go and buy the toothpaste, you're buying with an infinite horizon. You know, you're taking into account the dentures your grandparents are going to need, your grandchildren are going to need in 150 years. Um, so what he's saying is families plan for an infinite future, 
So if there's an increase in the deficit today, you save more to give the quest to your great great grandchildren so they can pay taxes in a couple of hundred years. You know, I'm afraid there's only one thing I can say about this particular argument, and that's what the hell was he smoking? Okay? You've got to be off of the fairies to put this sort of stuff forward. And that's why I say you've got to read the originals to notice how delusional some of this stuff is, because you won't see that in the textbook. The textbook will make some argument about being rational. Okay, with that, because you know they're using the definition of, of uh, prophetic instead. So we've got this delusional idea of prophetic agency plan for an infinite future. And I talk about that in more detail in my lecture, in, in, which I gave in Rome last week. And they have a non monetary equilibrium vision of capitalism, which is a pity because capitalism is monetary and out of equilibrium. Now, in that vision, the, the government has to run a balanced budget over time, but those assumptions don't hold. So that actually argument can't possibly work. But it still became the popular belief in neoclassical economics. And that's still the basis of what the EU is doing today. Originally in the belief that they would actually cause a stimulus to the economy by cutting back on government spending now. So what is the real impact of a surplus? Well, I'm going to take that endogenous money model I showed you a moment ago and add government spending in a very, very simple way, just saying the government spending is financed by the central bank. Okay. Far more complicated than that, but that's at least the, the basics of the system. The central bank will buy some bonds off the government to fund its expenditure. And then when you pay taxes, you pay the, pay the loan back to the central bank. There's an extra table here, very, very simple as you can see. I think you can see the back row there. So that's the loans from the government as an asset of the central bank, or loans to the government are an asset of the central bank, and the reserves of the private banks are the liability of the central bank. And I'm going to test three simple scenarios. A balanced budget, so at all times taxation equals government spending. A 1% deficit, which is obviously bad according to the, the European Union. And a 1% surplus, which is good but not good enough for them because they want to run a 4% surplus in, in Greece right now. Well, here's the balanced budget approach. And I've got government spending equal to tax at 24% of GDP. And I run it, and you get a rising GDP, Government deficit to GDP remains constant, and government debt falls to zero as a percentage of GDP over time. Okay. So, if, if you have a growing economy and you have neither and you run a balanced budget, ultimately your debt will become zero percent of GDP. What about if you run a, a deficit? Here I've got government spending being 25 percent and tax being 24 percent indefinitely, which according to Barrow would be impossible. And what you get? When you do that, this level of debt stabilises as a percentage of GDP, in this particular simulation, roughly 15% of GDP, indefinitely. So it's quite possible to sustain an, in, in, an indefinite deficit when you have a growing economy. Now, what about if you do what the EU wants and run a surplus? So here I've got taxation being 25%, spending being 20, oh, sorry, taxation being 24%, and government spending being 23%. So I simulate this, and yeah, you get a growing economy for a while, and then it crashes. So what went wrong? Well, what's going on here is that we live in a monetary world in which there are, within one international economy, there are two ways to create money. Banks can lend it out, so loans exceeding repayments means banks are creating money, and the government spending can exceed taxation, which also creates money. Now, if instead taxation exceeds spending, which is the proposal the EU wants for the whole of the European Union, then government spending, governments running a surplus is taking money out of the economy, and unless that's compensated for by the private sector lending, the private banks lending more money into existence than the banks taking out, you'll ultimately collapse. So the only way you're going to survive this is the private banking sector, the sector continues creating more and more debt. And of course they lend really responsibly, don't they? So what we've got is this belief that surpluses are good and deficits are bad, this knee-jerk attitude. And that's the basis of the fiscal compact, but it's based on a model which ignores money and debt and banks. But it's got to be wrong. And what it's doing is treating money a bit like a physical thing that we can all accumulate. And a good friend of mine, Michael Kumoff, who's a not a neoclassical dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, though, who nonetheless takes money, debt and banks seriously, he makes a wonderful argument in one of his most recent papers that he said the way that they talk about money is as if it's like gravel 
that you need to make roads and you don't need to put some of the gravel in a gravel bank and then somebody else borrows the gravel from you and repays it with gravel later. It's a physical thing. Okay? That's the sort of vision they have. If that's the case, and if there's somewhere in people mining gravel somewhere, then we can all accumulate positive balances of gravel okay? over time. But what we've got is money which is fiat money created by the government and credit money created by the banks. And banks, if you actually had them saying, let's try to make our receipts greater than our expenditure, behaving like a business, trying to get a positive balance, that would mean their repayments exceed their loans. So over time, the economy would collapse. And equally, if governments have receipts greater than expenditure, that means taxes exceeding, exceeding spending, and that would collapse the fiat money supply. So we're actually, the, the idea of applying a surplus to those two entities is saying, let's, let's destroy all the money in the world and see what happens. Won't it be good? So this is the neoclassical vision. You've got somebody mining the stuff somewhere. There's an external source you know, coming from the physical planet somewhere of the a money commodity. It's really a commodity vision of money. And therefore, everybody in the system can decide to save a surplus. So the business surplus is, you know, business receipts exceed expenditure, they make a profit. Households, wages exceed spending, they put money in the bank. Banks should ignore them anyway. They don't actually turn up in any of their models. And the government runs a surplus, taxes exceed spending. That'd work if that was the world we were in. This is the whole thing about Robert, uh, Robert Solo. What planet are we on here? This isn't Earth. Okay? The real world is where money is created by bank lending and by government deficits. So what you want to have is loans exceeding repayments most of the time. In a growing economy, you want loans to exceed repayments. That will create credit money, which then is it's there possible for businesses to run receipts greater than expenditure and have a positive bank balance and, and the households the same, and equally the government. So you want to have two deficits and two surpluses. Okay? That's the balance you want in a functional economy. Instead, what we're trying to make is, is to have all surpluses, which can't work. So you can't ignore private debt, because if you have a non-bank lending system, and you have this commodity money, then if the borrower, the borrower gets more money to spend, the lender gets less, they cancel out. But when in the real world with bank lending, borrowers get more money to spend, bank assets rise and demand rises with it. A non-bank repayment doesn't matter in a system without banks. The borrower has less spending power, the lender has more once the debt's repaid. But when you have bank repayment, the bank the borrower has less to spend and bank assets fall. There's actually less money in the economy. So who is right that the entire economy can be balance sheet constrained, balance sheet constrained? The constraint on spending is the size of the aggregate, the liability side of the banking balance sheet. And if that shrinks, we're all constrained in our spending by having less money to spend. So Kerr's right, Krugman is wrong. But of course, the dilemma we have is that, yes, it's good to have banks lending money, but not as much as they did during the bubble, and not for the sort of things they financed during the bubble, which are fundamentally Ponzi schemes. So you can have irresponsible lending. And that's what we have now. Of course, I often get the argument, well, yeah, okay, that such might be true, but maybe look at Greece. Doesn't that need to be running austerity? Because they were so, there was, government was so irresponsible in Greece. This is where it's really convenient not to read history. Because you can make statements like that without analysing them. So did irresponsible lending by the Greeks cause the crisis? Well, the data's available. And that's what it looks like. The blue line is government debt. And yes, that's quite a high level of government debt, 100% of GDP back in 2000. But it doesn't change until after the crisis. Okay? It can't have caused the crisis. It was that level for 10 years before the crisis began. Look what happened to private debt. Flatlining at about 40% of GDP right through to 1995, and then way up to 100 and something percent when the crisis began, and continued to rise because the GDP was falling after that event. So it's a similar pattern to America. So it's high government debt, fair enough, but there's no change in the ratio over time. And when you look at the scale of the private debt uh, lower, it's the same thing that happened in America, only bigger. It's from 30% to 120% across those periods. So bank lending, just as I said bank lending was the source of the crisis in America, it's also the source of the crisis in the USA. So let's do a bit of a comparison of the two. So here's government debt. 
The blue line is Greek government debt, the red is American. Yep, sure, bigger level for the, um, for the Greek, but there's no trend in either before the crisis. Okay, if you're focusing on that to say, well, there's anything going wrong with capitalism, everything's fine, everything's fine, which is what the OECD was saying. But both rise after the crisis, and then look at the Americans. That's now tapering and starting to fall because their GDP is rising. Now, the Greek ratio is rising, not because they're spending more money, it's because their GDP is falling. That's why the ratio is rising. Looking at private debt, in this case, it's the Americans are more irresponsible. A high level of private debt, the, their private debt level um, before the crisis was 130% of GDP back in 2000, rose to about 160, 170%, and rose a bit more after that, then fell. So they're both rising, and they both went to reach a peak after the crisis. Looking at the, the deficits, government spending. Okay, government spending, yes, Greek spending was normally higher than American. This is to set deficit, uh, the increase in government debt as a percentage of GDP was bigger throughout. But notice what happens after the crisis. The American level of spending actually rises, then reaches a peak and then slowly falls, never goes negative. The Greeks, thanks to the Troika, down to minus 30% of GDP for a couple of years. So they both rise after the crisis, but the US continues to run deficits, whereas this enormous impact of deflation coming in from the Troika's policies that were supposed to be expansionary. And the key difference between the two economies is private sector deleveraging, because both had this rising level of private debt before the crisis, both leveraging up very, very similar rates of growth. Then when the crisis hit, both start to delever, but the Americans then start relevering again. They're back into borrowing money as of 2010, the rate of decline of debt slowed down, and then it began to rise, and finally they're now positive. there's now positive increases in, in private debt in America. But Greece is just deleveraging all the way through. So that's the impact of the government's austerity. It didn't stop the private sector from continuing to delever, whereas the Americans did. And unemployment follows those patterns. This is now looking at the relationship between unemployment and debt change in America. And I've now inverted the unemployment scale, so the correlation is more obvious there. That's the minus 0.9 I showed you a while ago. Is Greece different? We'll see in a moment. Minus 0.93 from 1998. That's when I get. Um, that's the earliest date I can get Greek unemployment data for. Look at Greece. Just continued going down. Same correlation, minus 0.94. And that level down there, bottomed out at 27, 28%. There's a bit of a rise going on now, which the, the EU is lauding as a recovery. I think uh, Benedict told me that they're saying Greece, uh, Greek um, GDP only fell by 0.9% last year. What a fantastic success that was. Well, it's, it's, de it's, it's stabilising because the rate of deleveraging has flattened out. Okay. It's not what the EU has done, it's what the private sector finders can't deliver any faster than they're doing right now. So this whole idea of treating the government like a business is a fallacy. We should treat the government like a bank. And just like a bank's goal is to have loans greater than repayments, the government's goal should be having spending greater than taxation. And should normally run a deficit. Not a thousand percent of GDP, people always say it's going to be too big a deficit. But clearly, the, the, the deficit the Americans ran, which is much larger than the maximum allowed by the EU fiscal pact, is why America's come out of the crisis so rapidly. I don't think it's a sustainable way out, but it's avoided the, the deep personal tragedy that Greece and Spain, Italy and other parts of Southern Europe are. So the government running a surplus extracts money from the economy. That's what we have to get into our heads. It's not a way of saving money, it's extracting money, it's into abolishing it. So there's three ways to create money. Private banks can lend out more than they get in repayments. A country can run a balance of payment surplus, which is what Austria and Germany normally do. And the government can run a deficit. Those are the three ways. And I can use a very rough rule of thumb here. It's very rough, just to give a guide. Um, but you can pretty much say that nominal GDP growth will be roughly equal to the sum of private debt growth, the government deficit, which is roughly government debt growth, and the balance of payment surplus. Very rough, but it gives you an idea of magnitudes. So I put that together, and for Greece, all three of those are negative now. Private and government were, debt was positive up till 2012. 
collectively. The current account deficit was always the negative contribution. Now, if you take a look at what's going on with, with, um, with both GDP change and those money sources, that's the last sort of relationship you get. GDP change is following money growth down. So it's ignorance about the nature of money that's made this crisis so bad and made the EU's advice so disastrously wrong. So they've, they've made the crisis much worse. They've turned a severe downturn into a Great Depression. And here's looking at what the Americans did. One counterbalances the other. That if, when the private sector spending went down and there's deleveraging by the private sector, government spending went up and compensated. But that's like the effect of the air conditioning unit I was talking about earlier. Greece, on the other hand, private down and public down as well. Smashing money out of the economy and making the crisis as bad as it was. Didn't have to be anywhere near as bad as it is in southern Europe. And now what you've got is deleveraging, running at 12% of GDP, it's an enormous rate in Greece right now, versus re-leveraging in the States. It's gone from minus 4% at the depth of the crisis in 2010 to plus 7% now. So the Troika's policy has failed because rather than stopping the private sector from deleveraging, it's forced it to continue deleveraging. Well, there have been two sources taking money out of the economy. It's gone from plus 3% um, deleveraging a place that actually the big Greek debt was still rising, private debt was still rising in 2010, from plus three percent of GDP to minus eight percent. So what the Troika has done is turn a strong downturn, would never have been a mild downturn, to turn a strong downturn into the second Great Depression of Europe. And the cause is bad economic theory. They think they're doing the right thing. This is actually a little anecdote I have in the, in the opening, in the preface of debunking the economics. I had a a uh, school, a Catholic school, I went to a Catholic school and had a, a brother there who was a, uh, a great character who let us have debates where we would just let one of us chair the discussion and he would sit at the back and not say a word. Fabulous chance to discuss ethics. We were discussing one politician back in those days, 40 years ago plus, and the, somebody was criticising him and somebody called out, well at least he's sincere. And the whole class basically admitted, yeah well he death can't argue that yes he's sincere. And this teacher piped up from the back row and said, don't overrate sincerity. The most sincere person you'll meet in your life is the maniac chasing you down the road with an axe trying to chop your head off. Now that's what the Troika is like. They sincerely think cutting your head off will make you feel better. So we need a theory of macroeconomic which is aware of the role of debt. And that's Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. And that's been my main research focus, which is why I was looking at debt way, way back. Um, in the 1980s. So Minsky wrote in 1982, Can It, A Great Depression, Happen Again? That, by the way, is the title, Can It Happen Again, is the title of a book of readings by Minsky. It was extremely accessible, extremely cheap, about $15, I think, very much worth buying to see what his arguments are. And he says that since it can happen, if, if it can happen, why hadn't it happened between World War II and 1982 when he wrote these words? And he said those are the questions that flow naturally from looking at the economic success between 1945 and the early 1980s. He said to answer those questions it is necessary to have an economic theory which makes Great Depressions one of the possible states in which our type of capitalist economy can find itself. Now neoclassical economics is not that theory. Okay? It can't generate it, which Minsky also says. He said the abstract model of the neoclassical synthesis cannot generate instability. When it's put together capital assets Banks and money creation, constraints imposed by liabilities, were all assumed away. For economists to do better, we have to abandon the neoclassical synthesis. And that's why I'm quite strong in saying that's what we have to do and build an alternative way of thinking about the economy. And Minsky's alternative, notice how debt plays an immediately important role here. He says the natural starting point for analysing the relation between debt and income is to take an economy with a cyclical past that is now doing well. On the inherited debt structure reflects the history of the economy, which includes a period where things didn't work out so well. There was a debt crisis. Now, because of that, everybody's conservative. Banks and lenders, bank, both borrowers and lenders are conservative. They both have the same, same shared negative expectations about the future. But because the economy is largely recovered, what becomes obvious is that debts are easily repaid and units that actually took out, companies that took out large amounts of debt prospered, it pays to lever. So this transforms the economy from tranquil growth into a boom. 
And he says, stable growth is inconsistent with the manner in which we finance investment. The debt financed investments, um, fund the fundamental instability of the capitalist economy is upward. The tendency to turn doing well into a speculative investment boom is the basic instability of the capitalist economy. So the focus is on money, debt and instability. Okay, a complete shift in the perspective of neoclassical economics, which is why neoclassicals can't model Minsky. Okay? When you see what they do, they say, okay, let's put this into an equilibrium model. Uh-uh, it's a disequilibrium model, fundamentally so. So I built a model of Minsky by taking the model from Richard Goodman, which is a cyclical model, something Minsky said you had to have. The model had to be cyclical to begin with. So I have capital producing output, this is Goodman's model from 1967, Capital produces output, output determines employment, the rate of employment determines wage change, that therefore determines profit, and this is extremely important, there's a non-linear relationship there. Our profit is output minus wages multiplied by labour, where both wages and labour are variables in the system. Profit determines investment, and when I modelled it, I got this, this is the sort of behaviour you get out of, Minsky, out of Goodwin's model. When you run it, you get a fixed cycle. Employment and wage share of output both cycle indefinitely, so that's those are the two being graphed against time over here and graphed against each other in that cycle there. Now I added two elements of realism to that model. The first is that capitalists invest more during booms than they do during slumps. Okay. So I needed a non-linear investment function to make that happen. And secondly, when they want to invest more the profits, they've got to borrow money. So this debt financed investment makes up for the gap between what the desired investment is and what retained earnings are. So you put it together, and what I got was a model that could have a breakdown. Now, pardon some of the messy graphics here, this is things we need more financing to fix up in Minsky, but watch over here, you'll see that closed loop beforehand behaves rather differently, and this shows you debt which wasn't in the model previously. And notice those cycles aren't closed anymore. They're migrating across with wages share falling. So there's an income distribution impact out of the model. Workers get less money. Even though they're not borrowing money, they're the ones who pay for the the higher debt level in the economy. Debt's rising, and the economy appears to be stabilising. Notice how the cycles in employment decline initially. But then they start to get wilder. And then you start to get cycles up in the level of debt as well over here. And ultimately this model breaks down. There's a final debt crisis where they have too much debt to come back and they can never repay it. That's, so that, that's, that's a model of a pure credit economy, yeah, not the one we live in. Okay, because we live in a mixed economy with both government and the private sector. So, and in reality, whether it wants to or not, at least initially, a government has to be kind of cyclical because it's, its revenues depend upon tax receipts, its expenditure depends upon welfare. So I brought in this argument that Minsky had as well, where he said big government can stabilise an unstable economy by giving a cash flow to firms they wouldn't otherwise have during a downturn. And what you get out of this is not breakdown anymore, but complex cycles. So if I run this model, take a look here. This is now the same thing, the cycle of wages versus employment. And what you get are complex dynamics. The system continues to cycle, but you don't get a breakdown like you get in the private sector only case. Now those are two extreme models, one with only a private sector, on the other with a government that holds the line. The, the, the line I had there was that the government's spending would rise when unemployment exceeded 5%. And of course in the real world, that, that's not how governments have behaved. Back in the 1960s, in my country, Australia, unemployment above 1.5% was unacceptable. Okay? Now, Unemployment above 6% is acceptable. There's been a huge shift in where governments draw the line over time. So they've lessened, and governments have lessened how progressive income taxes are, so they don't cut off the boom like they used to or could have done back in the 50s and 60s. So there's still a positive relationship between unemployment and the range of rate of change in government spending, but it doesn't cut back the booms. So I argued back in 1995 you still have debt induced breakdowns. Increased spending would enable a recovery, but you could still have a, a long slump. So the real world fits sort of between those two models. That's what my guess was would happen in the actual economy. So that's what actually did happen. Now, why was it not seen by conventional economists? Again, because they dismissed the idea that debt matters. 
from a priori grounds, arguing that just because assets equals liability, you can forget about debt. This is Bernanke, who supposedly got the position as Federal Reserve Chairman on the basis that he was supposed to be an expert on the Great Depression. And one of the most influential papers about the Great Depression was Fisher's debt deflation theory. And effectively, he dismisses it, saying it was less influential because of the counter-argument that debt, a debt deflation is no more than a redistribution from one group to another. And without any plausibly large differences in spending propensities, pure redistributions should have no large macroeconomic impact. Now, it's not a pure redistribution. It creates and destroys money. Okay? When you destroy money by debt repayment and it repayment exceeds new loans, you have a direct negative impact upon economic growth. And today's policies, courtesy of the EU in particular, are compounding that problem. So that's how bad economic theory has made a bad economic situation worse. And as a finale, I'll just have a few comments on the state of economic theory. And what I find frequently that conventional economists are bewildered when they're criticised. They really can't understand why students are angry at them. But they genuinely think they're doing the right thing. They've got you know, complicated theories. They're, um, they're sure that that's the only way you can do economics. Why are students complaining about it? So they think they're scientific and they think they're doing good. But they also don't know their own history. They're ignorant about how their own discipline has developed over time. And Robert Solo has now become probably the major campaigner against dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. Because he's a doyen of the school, he developed neoclassical growth theory on which this stuff is based. And he's now a staunch critic of the mainstream. So you're not alone. If you're criticising it as a student, you can quote Robert Solo back at anybody who says you don't know what you're talking about. Okay? So he's been critiquing it for over a decade and been ignored throughout that decade by the mainstream. So they're not just ignoring you, they're ignoring a Nobel Prize winner. Now, what he wrote back in 2001 is a civil statement here saying the puzzle he wanted to discuss in a, in a seminar on the development of macroeconomic theory is he knew that 40 years ago he worked out the, a simplified version of growth theory. They then found out that a guy called Ramsey had done it back in 1928 with a more complicated model. But he said when he did it, it was obvious to him that it didn't apply to the business cycle. He said now if you look at any article today, in a mainstream journal with the word business cycle inside it, there's a fairly high probability that its basic orientation will be a slightly dressed up version of neoclassical growth theory. And he said, the question I want to circle is, how did that happen? Okay. He thinks it's simply insane that it occurred. And now, after the crisis, one intriguing event was that the US United States Congress had a hearing into economic theory, one of the Senate committees or Congress committees. And it invited five witnesses, including V.V. Chow, who was a very staunch, dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium modeler, I think in working for the Bank of Minnesota, and so on. And at that meeting, Carrie was pretty much pounding the table saying, you have to have DSG modelling. It's the only way you can do economics. He said, if you, a useful aphorism, okay, is that if you have an interesting story to tell, you can tell it in a DSG model that's coherent. If you can't, the story is incoherent. Okay? Now, what Solo said to exactly the same people on exactly the same day is that any proposition in economics should pass the smell test. That's why I talked about not having a, the sanitising effect of economic theory beforehand. He said, current DSG models imagine, pretend, that you can take the entire economy as a single consistent dynasty, carrying out a rationally designed long-term plan, disturbed by shocks but reacting to that in a rational, consistent way, he said, that doesn't pass the smell test. Okay. He said, protagonists make claims about respectability by being based on micro-theory, but look at this punchline. The advocates believe what they say, but they've lost their sense of smell altogether. Okay. So if you want to, if you talk to your own staff and they're telling you you can't understand what you're talking about, quite so. And on he goes. He said the main argument is aesthetic. It's supposed to be compatible with general equilibrium theory. Now, that's not true, okay? Because if you look at general equilibrium theory, a thing called the sonnenschein mantle to Broch condition shows you can't aggregate to a representative agent. That's not how they treat it. They imagine that it means you can, but strictly speaking, you can't. He said that's a misconceived argument. 
It, there's no justification for the representative Asian construct, even when they have multiple Asians, where they again bang together workers and capitalists into one group. Now, he's not just critical of the new classical school, it's also the new Keynesian school. He talks about this is the simple sort of real business cycle model, which is the, this, the uh, freshwater thing, has had little of success. So the free spirits, meaning in this case the new Keynesians, so called, have loosened up allowing for imperfections. That's all the stuff that Woodford and friends have done. He said, that fits, sounds better and fits the data better. Not amazing. So intelligent economists have used these imperfections to make them fit the data better. Not that it's an improvement. And again, saying, looking at the actual model, you have a single agent optimising over infinite time with perfect foresight, with perfectly competitive markets and perfectly flexible wages and profits, and he says, how could anyone expect a sensible short to medium run macro to come out of that setup? This is just how heavily he's bashing it and saying, you want macro that can explain pathologies in the economy. He said, a model that rules out pathologies by definition is unlikely to help. So again, hammering this whole thing. And when some mainstream economists assert that you don't understand economics, they're showing you their ignorance, not yours. And the student movement for pluralism and economics is utterly justified. They keep on hammering away. So what Europe needs, rather than what it's getting, is deficits. Not the fiscal compact, but deficits to counter that private sector deleveraging and slow it down. We should abolish large parts of the debt in the first place, the private debt, because it should never have been created in the first place, with irresponsible lending by the banks. We need to control them to stop them financing debt bubbles in the future. And maybe the best way to start this would be to hold the European Conference on Debt, rather like one that held back in the uh, post-Second World War period, where you put both private and public debt on the table. We've got to get the debate, We've got to get them to recognise that private debt matters. Maybe a debt conference is the way to go about that. But we also have to get away from bad economic theory. We need a monetary, non-equilibrium, dynamic approach to economics. And that's what I'll be teaching at Kingston. Hope to see some of you there. Thank you.